Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron Kessler. I'm Assistant Director for Learning Sciences and Teaching in uh, Open Learning as part of the Residential Education team. We're here to sort of support courses, course teams in everything related to Canvas, the tools around it, and how those get implemented. We are the people who help run the resources page for both instructors and TAs, as well as that sort of enrolled TA training, if you know about that. We help with uh, classroom Lightboard capture, classroom video capture, all of the sort of those pieces. Uh, and then we also have the residential MITx platform. So we help facilitate and make sure that gets implemented across settings. Um, so we also then amplify all of the amazing work that course teams, instructors, faculty are doing through a number of events, including X Talks like today, the Festival of Learning, uh, and uh, the Teaching with Digital Technology Awards, which, by the way, the only student-nominated and student-judged awards that are handed out uh, across MIT. So I always love to plug that one, which is awesome. A uh, number of award winners floating around today. Um, so just a, a shout out, if you need help with any of those things, including ideas, you just want to brainstorm, you'd like to hear more about something, please reach out, uh, ol-residential at mit.edu. We're happy to, to help and sort of consult. But why we're all here today is because our group is also responsible for running what's called the Canvas Innovation Fund. Um, so as you're going to hear from people today, you're going to hear their experiences actually going through this project uh, last summer and then implementing the outcomes of those throughout the, the term. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about what it is. So the Canvas Innovation Fund is meant to help MIT instructors transform their subjects on Canvas in ways that increase their instructional effectiveness. Um, and it can be used to implement a wide range, as we're going to sort of see today, of different instructional innovations, in both the class and in using Canvas to do those pieces. Um, if you have questions, want to learn more, I really encourage you to go check out the website. We have the Canvas Innovation Fund. It's on the open uh, Canvas page. You can use that or those links. We'll circle back to that later if you, if you need the link. Um, but really what I want to do is set up like what does this actually look like? So it's, it's nice to talk about that like hey that sounds great but that also sounds like a lot of work and I don't have time, right? So let's talk a little bit about what the, the sort of process for being involved in this fund is. Um, so the first step is you submit an application. It's a pretty easy application. It shouldn't take you more than like 10 or 15 minutes, honestly, to fill out. Um, and what we're trying to do is collect an idea of what is it that you're trying to accomplish? What are your goals for transforming the course? What does that look like? We select award winners. And then uh, as part of that award work, we ask you to identify a student who you think would be great to work on your course. The student is meant to be a learning technologist over the summer, work directly with you and our team, including myself and Lauren Titino in the back. Um, and so the idea is, is this student is someone who has either taken the course in the past or has been a UTU for you and can work over the summer up to about 20 hours a week on the project. So we ask that we sort of work together to hire that student. Uh, I'll talk more about what we do to support the students here in a minute. But then we ask you to be part of a kickoff meeting. And at the kickoff meeting, we sort of try to do three things. The first one is we try to understand the goals as you, for you as an instructor. What is it that you're trying to accomplish? What do you want your students to know and leave your class with? We want to understand what challenges you're faced with. What are the places where you're like, you know, I, I think this is going really well over here, but over here, I really wish they were engaged more in this type of discussion. Or I really wish that I had more spaced out practice to have my students have opportunities to do the, these sorts of problems. Or I want to ch completely change the way that I'm presenting some of this material. Like, those are all things we can talk about. And then we set up an initial plan and we set some key goals. Uh, so that's all the kickoff meeting. And then Myself, Lauren, the learning technologist go to work trying to sort of put together a plan and some ideas and brainstorming and actually building and user testing and doing some things. And then we sort of circle back to, to the groups, uh, sometimes at a midpoint meeting, sometimes sooner than that, um, but sort of midpoint in the project. And we do a check-in. And at the midpoint, we share those updates. We give you some ideas and some options that might be what you want to do for the course. We reevaluate, does this meet what the goals were? Does this match what you had hoped would, would sort of come of it? Um, and then we sort of set a plan for, okay, how are we gonna finish the project? What is it gonna look like to get to the end? Um, and then we sort of work through to, we get to a close. At that point, we sort of go through cycles of iteration, actually building out the course site, putting the materials where they need to go, putting things in place, whatever the goals are. 
Uh, and then we have this closed meeting. And at the closed meeting, one of the things we try to do is hand off a completed set of resources to you. So that includes probably things that are on Canvas, but also um, documentation. Uh, sets of documents and materials that allow you to know, hey, here's exactly what your next step should be. Here's exactly how you can move forward with doing this again. Here's what it means to copy this course forward sometime in the future, right? So we try to make it as easy and user friendly for the faculty, course teams, and instructors that are involved in the process. So it gives you sort of an overview of, of what the CIF looks like. I will say, for the learning technologists, it's a little more involved, right? We have a bunch of other steps in the process, including some training, some pre-kickoff meetings, and then one-on-one -on -one and group meetings weekly to sort of support one another as they engage in this work of, of building out these resources and materials. Um, if you are interested in this, applications are due April 26th for, for those that might want to circle back to this. Um, and that's enough of me yammering on. Nobody wants to hear any more about that. But we've got some amazing uh, presenters today who are going to talk about their experience in the Canvas Innovation Fund project, what they did, what it looked like, and sort of the outcomes. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Maria Katimsky, the senior lecturer in Russian, uh, who reorganized uh, her Canvas site to clearly share learning goals and ensure social presence in asynchronous class sessions. Thank you very much, Aaron, for your introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I will talk today about my experience uh, with Canvas Innovation Fund over the past summer, improving and streamlining Russian 3 uh, class. I'll share what the goals were, uh, what changes were implemented, and the lessons learned. So a little bit about the project context. It's the third semester Russian language class that uh, implemented the new schedule starting fall to two, where we have three in-person meetings and one hybrid asynchronous day. And that was probably the biggest question with which I came to the Canvas Innovation Fund, how to make construction on that hybrid asynchronous day more effective and clear to the students, which necessitated the Canvas site revision and uh, which also um, relied uh, very much on the help of a student who had taken this class, who had the experience and who had some ideas on how to improve this. Our key concerns were the module structure and of the overall layout of the class because this course does not use a conventional textbook. We rely on instructional models, uh, quizzes that I have developed, grammar videos. So basically I very much depend on the Canvas um, LMS site as a learning tool for the class. Uh, because the LMS is so important important. Let's, uh, let's take a quick look back. Uh, remember this time, <laughs> right, uh, when we were on Stellar and Global Languages was lucky to have a Canvas pilot in 2017. So I pulled up my older uh, site and I realized that in the beginning we were treating Canvas very much like Stellar as an aggregate of our files and maybe homework assignments. Uh, COVID uh, gave us an opportunity to rethink the website. So by the time I came to see Canvas Innovation Fund, my class website site had the following structure. Each module had an introductory page with a schedule that looked somewhat cluttered and the length of the module was getting out of hand. So I was not happy with it. I was also not happy with how asynchronous day was presented. It was kind of in between other homework tasks and I didn't know what to do with it, right? So that those were fairly simple tasks. It's not a major curricular innovation, but a structural redesign of existing curriculum. So what uh, CIF helped us achieve is in consultation with Lauren and with Mackenzie, our wonderful student, we made a big switch to weekly modules with clear and transparent structure. Uh, we also reassessed the schedule structure, the rhythm of the class and the assignments, and uh, we played with several layouts of the weekly module structure, identified the one that works best. Also in conversation with the student, we identified the lack of communication in the class and uh, brainstormed ways to improve that. And in terms of hybrid day, our students recommended developing a dedicated area within the module and also on the module landing page, uh, she developed a separate section for each week, clearly stating the goals for this Thursday and emphasizing 
emphasizing the role of um, a synchronous day in the weekly schedule. So thanks to her input, we had instructions on the module landing day as well as on the asynchronous day to emphasize what happens on that day. And she also came up with a clever idea of having more compact schedules, but also having hyperlinks to all the assignments uh, within the module. In terms of the communicative piece, uh, we made a decision to have weekly updates uh, with both video and text messages, reminding the students what is due uh, during this week, what they are to expect, what innovation is going on, and what um, programs are happening around campus. So very quickly to summarize, I guess the difficulties we encountered was the time, right? Uh, needed to redesign each weekly module and each lesson to break it down into weeks and to uh, fine tune the assignment load in each week. Uh, I guess the next challenge is communication and how to make sure our messages get to the students. I think working with CIF allowed me to see the importance of more uh, communication and different venues of communication. Uh, consistency across modules and we are now working to implement the same module structure across the entire class sequence in Russian one through four. Uh, Cross-linking within the module was something we learned to do better. Uh, we also worked with Canvas Potential developing Canvas quizzes, but also using additional tools. So I will close on a question to all of you. If there are any other tools we can integrate, such as H5P, that would be very much appreciated because we did develop some new tasks for asynchronous days using H5P and right now it's not directly linked to Canvas. Uh, last but not least, I would love to thank everyone involved. Mackenzie Dineson, the student who helped me with the project, Joseph Barkovsky, uh, who made me aware of it, and wonderful uh, teaching and learning lab staff. So in summary, as you can see, the Canvas Innovation Fund can have an impact even through small steps that make your class more coherent, more clear to the students, and more pedagogically sound uh, thanks to this revision. So that's it. Uh, Rick is the program manager for the MIT Game Lab, uh, teaches CMS 611, uh, and was working to understand and try to balance um, course project work uh, with appropriately timed feedback. That was sort of the, the big challenge of, of sort of coming to, to the work. Um, so yes, I'm talking about uh, my course uh, CMS 611, uh, and it's cross-listed with course 6 is 64570 games. Uh, and my, I'm Rick Eberhardt, I'm a program manager at the, la at the MIT Game Lab, a research scientist, a game designer, and an instructor. Um, and we co-teach, uh, we're team teaching uh, this class with three other designer, programmer, engineer, scientists. We're all wearing many hats and representing many different aspects of, of development in the class. So some context, um, the course is primarily about project management for creative software projects but it's called creating video games because we're not gonna get students to come to, say, to project management for, uh, for games. Um, and we're getting our students to form larger multidisciplinary teams. For many of them, it's the largest code base they've worked with. Um, that's their own code um, at MIT and it's the largest team that they've worked on uh, at MIT. Uh, it's a project-based course. We have three group project assignments that build upon each other. Uh, so two, uh, first two team assignments are Pretty small, two, two to four students to a team, making low fidelity prototypes and then making a digital prototype with the last assignment to work in a larger team. A uh, minimum of five students, maximum of eight students on a digital game based on some kind of common constraints this past fall as multiplayer games. Um, and as you can see with many different people, this is kind of the, the, the key thing I want my students to get away. There's a lot of lines of communication between them. And this is just with six, it gets even bigger with seven or eight. So how do we introduce tools? How do we introduce ref reflective practices and feedback practices uh, into the course is, is really important. It's one of the things we brought to our CIF meeting was this kind of context. Um, in between, we run discussion sessions on Canvas and in class. We have both short lectures in class, flip lectures on Canvas, just-in-time workshops about project management elements, and a couple short individual assignments. Um, the class is twice a week for three hours each session, so it's a very long period of time, uh, which usually about an hour of lecture, an hour of guided activity, and a third hour to work in their team projects, right? So you can already see, like, we have a lot of time, but it keeps getting subdivided and taken up. Uh, our students are all undergraduates, and they're a mix of CMS and Course 6, but some Harvard and Wellesley students in the mix. Um, I also just want to give a shout out to MIT students. They're not just programmers and designers, but we get sound designers, artists, musicians, writers, voice actors, uh, skills they don't normally get to explore in their coursework, they get to bring to our, our, our class.
All right. So prior to the Canvas Innovation Fund, you're going to see some pretty common things, right? Everyone went through the pandemic uh, Zoom year in 2020, and we adopted Canvas at the same time. Um, we had the old learning module system before, so we had Stellar in the beginning, and then we moved to the learning module system. That was amazing. And in fact, we did kind of do a, a switch to a day-to-day -day, um, organization in, in learning modules. Um, and so when we went to Canvas, it was pretty much we just brought it over. We had a student help us kind of put it in this weekly module format, but it's very much just a day-to-day -day list of all the things that we're doing. Um, but this was a great opportunity because our course is about 16 years old now. It can drive, but like any teenager, it's got some bad habits we wanted to reconsider. So, uh, and the great thing, the reason why I would invest, uh, ask everybody to, to, to consider doing the, this uh, uh, fund, this improvement project, we get to hire a student to work with us. Um, this, we hired uh, our, our student, Adam Bundy, who took the class a year prior, uh, to talk through the class, and basically we got that student perspective that we'd been missing. We get it through their feedback, we get it through their, their assignments, but this was really one-on-one -on -one time with the student is like to actually see the course, how they take it, and what their, uh, what their perspectives are. Um, also, it's a project management course. This is a slide from uh, my syllabus, the first class. This is us eating our own dog food. Um, we talk a lot in the course about knowing your users, playtesting materials, prototyping and iteration, so this is a chance for us to do that as well. So we had a meeting with Adam, uh, Aaron, and the CIF team, and we were able to identify the following areas for improvement. So we have a four-person teaching team. Um, we have a diversity of opinion, but no one knows what anybody else is doing, and we often just get miscommunication all sorts of the ways. It happens to our students, it happens to us. Uh, so we're not always on the same page. Um, so we wanted to not have require all of us to be in the classroom at the same time. It's also, we're still in the pandemic, so people are getting sick. What happens when one of us is out? Can someone else take the slack and, and run the course for the other person? Um, pedagogically, we wanted to improve student self-reflection processes. Um, we have a weekly diary that they, that they did um, that the students were doing. We wanted to improve that um, because we weren't really getting the responses we want out of that. And we have all these assignments and workshops, and in our heads we knew how they related to each other, but it was not always clear to the students. And we knew that through the clarifying questions they asked us, but also just when they would turn in an assignment, it's not at all what we intended. It's like, all right, something, there's a, there's a miscommunication going on right there. So I don't think the specifics of what we did is important to this group, but I do want to talk through them because it helps um, unpack the process. And that, that, I think, is the important thing. Uh, what we went through to make these changes and what we're doing next in the course. So um, past us was kind of awesome in that we already have a spreadsheet of pretty much every single day in the class that had everything that we were doing. Um, so we, we were basically going to have Adam come in and just redo the Canvas course for us. By updating this earlier than usual, um, he was able to just create our, a draft Canvas page that if we had just left with that, we actually would have been in a great shape, but we wanted to go, go further. Um, this also just helped us as a practice to define which instructor would be covering what. So if you are team teaching, I highly recommend doing this sort of thing. Um, at least so you know, if you can look at one document, who is doing what, um, you know where everything is. Through working with Adam, we were able to consider how other students in the course see Canvas. If anybody can see the screen, this is the assignments page. Most students that I talk to just look at my assignments because they're looking for particular tasks, right? Um, what do I need to do tomorrow? What's going on next week? I don't want to think about a month from now, and I don't want to think about the past. I just, what are those immediate things? So Canvas is great. It defaults to assignments by due date. Um, there's also the inbox that we'd been using, but not quite uh, so much. And then we also wanted to look at the modules view uh, as well, because we did want to get, get our students to actually use that more and more. Um, we'd always expected students to prior prioritize the assignments view, so all of our readings had due dates. I think basically the, the fund helped us understand, and this work helped us understand, we were actually doing some things right, um, which was a relief on our part. Uh, the second aspect, aspect in self-reflection, this is a largely technical exercise, um, and we're still actually improving this assignment. Um, previously, this was a hack. Um, we had tried to hack the discussion posts, and so if you can imagine creating 56 different discussion post threads for 56 different students, it's supposed to be private, so they're all private, because the idea was, well, discussion posts have comments, and I want to give comments on it, and students are going to read that. Not true, actually. Students are going to read the comments to the assignments. And so we created basically a very simple template um, that was pre-filled, had pre-filled boxes. A student would fill in a box, export it as a PDF, submit it as assignment. All the assignments are discrete. All the assignments had prompts um, attached to them. Um, and so actually, we got much better responses uh, from our students over the course of the semester. Uh, some key things. Um, 
I like to be really flexible in class and say something and expect them to understand it and see it. Uh, and one of the things that we've taken from this is anytime we do that, we take a note, we add it to Canvas. Because uh, students, while they are taking notes, um, while they do have uh, opportunities for accessibility and things like that, they're relying on Canvas for everything right now to, to manage a lot of their classes. So we're making sure that all the prompts, and in fact, I'm going to create default prompts for each week, which I didn't have before. Um, and lastly, to bring cohesion to the course, we went back to how the students were using Canvas again and looking at the modules. They were already broken down ba day by day, so we just then said, all right, what's one next level above that, and gave them a unit uh, structure. Um, the big innovation was the weekly summary for each of those units. So again, what do I need to do to tomorrow? What am I doing next week? And this came from, from our student, Adam, where we created a weekly summary that just lists everything we're going to do in the class. Uh, it has the assignments we're going to do, the discussion we're going to do. This is also set as an automated uh, reminder to their inbox for those students who opt in to receiving inboxes to their emails. Um, actually, many of them did. Uh, which was which was great to hear. Um, so we'll definitely be doing this again. This is also actually really good for for other instructors. Uh, if you're covering for another instructor and you're just looking for a quick way to go, this is so much easier to parse in that spreadsheet. We still have the spreadsheet and it does get updated, but this generally is the most up to date version of what we're doing next. Lastly, uh, what are the real outcomes and the reason why I can even tell you about any of this stuff? Because my brain is Swiss cheese from COVID and everything else. Uh, is the decision tracker that Adam made. Uh, and the, and the team made, um, which has every problem that we were trying to solve, possible solutions, pros and cons for each, and then highlighted the actual solution that we did. Um, so that as we move forward, when we do this revision, we can then say, actually, this isn't working. Well, what else did we think about? And we can kind of go back to that. We do have the checklist, and that's, that's great too, but I really rely on, on this a lot, at least to give this presentation. And lastly, um, there were some other great things we got from the project, just having this experience someone else, your pedagogical approach um, means you're doing more self-reflection on your own part and what, and you're really thinking about the values that you're bringing into the classroom. Uh, the thing we identified is actually after this whole thing, we kind of lost a little bit of the project management stuff because we were focusing very much on the individual experience of the, of the student. Um, but we have identified now because of all this work, we know where we can save time to actually insert feedback time into the classroom sessions. And so a big thing is actually just going to be doing more fl flipped lecture, even though students aren't crazy about it. Um, we're identifying certain things we need to bring into class, certain things you can do outside of class. Many things, especially for a class like ours, um, and for any of those classes where you just have so much material but you know you're not going to go through everything, um, just having it in your back pocket to give uh, to a student, because we also don't have a textbook. Um, so um, just more shouts out to Open Learning. We've got Open Courseware from our 2014 course, fully video recorded. We did an MITx course in 2016. We've got our 2021 Zoom sessions, and we recently just did an XPro course. Um, that we delivered. So we've got all this video content we can bring into our Canvas page and we'll be looking to do so as, as well. So lastly, my kind of information if you want to uh, talk more about games and uh, curriculum and pedagogy, I want to thank Adam and Bundy and Aaron Kessler and the rest of the team for their help through this and of course acknowledge my co-instructors Philip Tan, Sarah Varelli, and Andrew Grant. Thanks. So uh, next up will be Tyler Smith. Uh, Tyler is instructor for TA training in introductory biology, uh, who is part of the 705 course team. Um, so they were looking for effective ways to present materials and reinforce learning uh, across topics uh, and some multiple digital resources that they had available as well. I'm Tyler. Um, I'm an instructor in the bio department. Um, and in the fall, I help intro bio. In the spring, uh, with the 705 course team, which is undergraduate biochemistry. Um, and so this class is mostly either second semester first years or second and third years. It's kind of the, one of the next classes uh, students will take if they're a bio adjacent major or bio major. Um, that's after kind of intro to bio. And so this course is about um, somewhere between 120 to 150 students. It's a large kind of lecture style course. Um, it's three lectures per week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and each lecture is one and a half hours. So this is about four and a half hours of new lecture content per week, uh, meaning it's a, it's a pretty fast-paced course. And so um, that's, I think, one of, when I joined the team, uh, one of the core things we've kind of been spending time thinking about is how do we give our students kind of scaffolding and resources to kind of help them process what is a lot of information over pretty long um, uh, lecture periods. And so, um, 
I get to kind of feel like a, a PI with this talk in that um, really the bulk of the work I'm going to talk about was done by um, an undergraduate, Catherine Duan. Um, she was in spring of 22 a, a student in the course and actually over spring of 23 and again this semester she's also been a recitation leader for us. Um, so she has a really unique perspective of having one experienced the course herself um, and ha kind of has the student's eye view and has also been on the flip side on the side of the teaching team. Um, so it's given us a lot of insight into how we organize our Canvas site. And so um, in collaboration with uh, Aaron Kessler, um, we took a kind of two-pronged approach uh, for our CIF project. Um, one was how can we kind of help um, in these hour and a half long lectures kind of reinforce core concepts so that if someone's getting lost halfway through, we can try and kind of pull them back in. Um, and the other was um, this course has been turned into a, a MOOC, a 705X, um, and so we have a lot of actually pre-existing online resources. Um, but it's quite challenging. You obviously don't want to just have someone take a course a second time. Um, so one thing we've been thinking about is how do we better integrate all of these resources we have in a very targeted manner. Um, so I'll start with the, the first of this approach, which was um, Catherine developed in-class polling questions. Um, for doing live knowledge checks. So she developed a bank of two to four polling questions um, for 36 lectures. So a pretty exhaustive, exhaustive bank we have uh, that now we can iterate on and tweak as needed. Um, and these polling questions we administer in class via Poll Everywhere. We then also integrate them back into Canvas so students, uh, we can embed Poll Everywhere polls straight into Canvas so that students can use them as study materials. Um, and we also incentivize participation in these polls using bonus points. So um, we just had exam one. So if students participated in nine out of exam one's 10 lectures, they got three bonus points on their exam. Um, and then, yeah, we then re use these as reference materials in Canvas. And I'll kind of show you an example if hopefully the, the audio works. Um, so this is a, a lecture that was taught, is taught by Professor Michael Yaffe, one of the, the three inch lectures for this course, one of the three professors. Um, and here's an example of a polling question we did that actually had kind of, uh, well, you'll see the results. Um, not some success, but a lot of students kind of confused. So to save you from just rewatching the biochemistry lecture, I think this was a nice example. He then goes on, he kind of identifies that there's actually a core principle the students weren't getting with this concept, that he then adds a, he asks a few more follow-up questions to kind of emphasize what students were getting wrong. You see the number shift a bit, because even though we don't give them credit for correct answers, um, they'll still all change their answer to the correct thing. But when this was initially shown, it was about like a 55% pass rate. Um, and I'll say as well, this lecture is kind of one of the ones we also chose to focus in on um, in some of our digital resources. Um, this is a topic that has traditionally been pretty challenging for students of PH and PKA. Um, okay, so that, that was kind of a nice example, I think, of a way that the professor was kind of able to catch in real time that a core misunderstanding the students have and kind of able to guide them back so that, you know, the rest, the 30 minutes that was remaining in the lecture, the students weren't just kind of sitting there, they're lost. Um, so the second thing that Catherine did is she spent a lot of time kind of reorganizing our Canvas resources to better kind of direct their attention and accessibility. Um, and so this was one from improving presentation of MITx digital resources. Um, she also generated topic lists for each lecture, wh which I'll show you in a moment. 
Um, and the other thing is, um, so the first half of this course is taught by Professor Yaffe, who I just showed. The second half is predominantly taught by Professor Matt uh, Vanderheiden, um, who uh, we don't have the same MITx resources for. So we provide students with old reference material lectures, um, but these were not spliced up and annotated in the same way as some of the MITx resources I'll show you. Um, so, oops. Um, this is a, um, our old course website. Um, and so if you find this kind of confusing to navigate or to figure out what's going on, that's the problem. Um, and so um, it, it was kind of similar to Maria, like we just kind of info dumped a bunch of things in these like weekly modules similar to Stellar. Um, and so this was our kind of redone by Catherine uh, Canvas site. So we now have really clear titles for what everything is. Um, we have handouts and readings. This was previously kind of just thrown in one of those long list of things. Um, we have these additional resources where she's made topic list for that lecture um, that links to these MITx um, learning sequences. And so you can see here these are kind of spliced up lectures um, that are um, short. This is like a 10 minute video that are followed by test yourself questions. And this is integrated via the um, staging integration, so these are directly integrated into Canvas. Um, the students do not have to navigate to an external MITx site at all to use these. Um, and likewise, I mentioned we also have um, the, the lectures by Professor Vanderheiden. Um, before, we kind of got the feedback that these were just kind of like long hour and a half lectures that were dumped as resource material that students would kind of just have to like jump around in to try and find the time he mentions like gap. Uh, or like FADH2. Um, Catherine went through 18 of these lectures and basically bookmarked all of the topics. Um, and so now I think like one of the extensions of this is now we can start thinking about, okay, now if we wanna make like test yourself questions for these, we now have all of these bookmarked already. Um, okay. So the last thing I'll talk about is I think um, this is kind of um, one thing we did this semester kind of trying to extend some of Catherine's work and where I think some of um, the foundation she's laid will go in the future. Um, so for the first time in this course, we've tried pre-work. Um, so like I said, these are hour and a half long lectures, a lot of material. Um, and we have these like really nice MITx resources, but again, it's not really feasible to ask students for every lecture to basically watch it twice. Um, so we targeted um, acids and bases um, and um, buffers. The, this is lecture two in our course, so it's in the first week of the course. And we tried um, utilizing these integrated MITx videos, um, and we assigned uh, pre-work targeted towards these core concepts. Um, and so we assigned them about four separate videos, which were cumulative about 20 minutes each. Um, so these are kind of the core concepts of the videos that we asked them to watch before they came to lecture. And we asked them to answer a few of the test yourself questions um, that were in these videos. Um, and this counted, we counted this as about, it was about a quarter of that week's problem set. Um, so it was also incentivized via grading. And so this worked, I, I think, um, very well. Um, so one, our completion rate of this assignment was 98%. Um, 138 out of our 141 registered students completed this assignment. Um, I think one or two of those are even like students that joined that day. Um, so that had like just added the class. Um, and I think as well, one thing that I think I was very surprised was, was it seems the student reception has been pretty good. So I received this email um, a day or two after this assignment, which was a, a student that said, you know, um, the MIT lecture videos and practice exercises, such as the lecture two pre-work, um, have been incredibly helpful. Doing them before class allows me to comprehend the lecture material so much more. Is it possible to have access uh, to these types of practice exercises before future classes? Um, so this is one of the first times I've had a student like ask for more graded work. Um, and at first I was like, oh, well maybe this is just, you know, one really ambitious student. Um, but the next day I got a second email <laughs> that was very similar. She found lecture two to be significantly more insightful because of the pre-lecture assignments and was basically asking for us to do more of this. Um, so this was very encouraging um, that we got the students to kind of buy into this or at least uh, some students. I think what was even more encouraging was, oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, let me just mute my glass. Um, 
for spring 23 before, so last spring when we did not have this, um, the question on exam one about this uh, concept um, had a score of about 70%. And you'll notice this is quite a bit lower than the overall exam median was of 81%. Um, this semester, we designed a question that was pretty much the same. It was a very, there's only so many ways you can ask buffer questions. Uh, so it was a very similar difficulty um, to that. And instead, this semester, our average on this question was 86%. Um, while the exam median stayed pretty much the same. So we brought the performance on this concept pretty much up in line with our overall um, exam median score. So that was very encouraging, and I think one thing we're thinking about is we've now established a kind of large, easy to use polling question bank that we can continue to iterate on, add questions that target the more challenging concepts. I've optimized the layout and ease of access of these resources. I think one thing that I'll probably be talking to Aaron about is I think one thing that'll be really interesting is to look at engagement metrics of these pages between last spring and this spring, uh, once the semester is closer to over. And I think one thing that I'm really excited about is like, can we continue to iterate on this pre-work model? Um, I think it, it can be a tricky thing to execute well, but I think there's clearly a desire from students for these kind of more structured and focused resources. Um, and I think that's one thing we'll be thinking a lot about, of like which of these resources do we choose to emphasize? I think this was a model of we picked a concept that was traditionally very challenging for students to kind of give them increased support in learning that topic. Um, so with that, um, I'd just like to thank you all for being here, as well as thank you to Aaron and Catherine Duan for all of their work um, in doing this for uh, 705. First off, amazing. Like, I'm just, what an awesome set of projects to, to show sort of the community what's, what's available. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on these seem so big, right? Like, I, I couldn't help but sit here for a moment and think, like, these were huge projects. But in reality, like, I don't, I don't know that any of us felt, like, in the middle of it that, that what we were doing was, like, this giant thing. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, one, how did it feel sort of going through this and sort of taking a moment to, to reflect having implemented it? Like, how hard was this for you versus what was sort of the outcome? Like, you, you've shared some great outcomes. I'm just curious this felt the right amount of work for a cycle of improvement. Uh, yeah, it was big, but we didn't do all everything we wanted to do. We did we identified everything we wanted to do, and then we were like, all right, what can we actually do? Um, and we did the things that were very targeted towards the specific goals we have, like, I want to do the polling questions thing. <laughs> um, I want a website, not just the Canvas page. But I can't do all that right now. So it was really, a, I think, having that first conversation and just kind of like unpacking everything and then having it, you telling us and the, our student, like Adam, telling us what he was hearing. It's like, all right, so based on that, I think we can identify like a couple core things. And we had that before the, before the mid-meeting. We had it pretty quickly after that first meeting. Yeah, th thank you so much. I want to do the emails and like kind of this is what we're doing this week, not only on the page which we've implemented, but this is genius. How did I not think of that? Um, thank you for your question, Aaron. I think if you said specific goals and like not aim for the sky, but think of specific actionable steps and there having the student's voice helps a lot. So where the student told me I sometimes felt lost, I wasn't sure where to find this. And if you give us more notifications this way, that would help. And actually she persuaded me to do little video announcements. She told me to give them up to 30 seconds, kind of this TikTok style, but really short, sweet, specific. So that was very doable. Having the student work with us, Mackenzie, was amazing. And it held us, I think, more accountable. So the Canvas site was ready to go at the beginning of the term. I think the um, caveat, of course, is sometimes the class space changes a little bit and you need to adjust. So I forward I might have the basic structure but also think of ways to leave flexibility especially in like messaging and scheduling yeah. thank you yeah I, I think for us it was very manageable like I, I was actually I mean I was very impressed with how much work Catherine was actually able to do that like she made polling questions for every lecture um, I don't think I was actually expecting her to finish them all uh, when we first set out and, and she did um, I think the, the kind of team dynamic of having input for, from yourself as well as I'm kind of having her being able to work on things, and then I touch base with her on like a weekly basis to kind of talk about, you know, give her feedback on question design and think about the overall macro of 
implementation. I think that's the real benefit of this is like, you know, because she was doing a lot of a lot of this work, I was able to focus a bit more on like, you know, how do I pitch this to the professors in terms of implementing it, right? And like, what does this look like in the course syllabus? And so I think being able to kind of triage and distribute that type of work and that kind of creative process helps a lot in being able to kind of achieve bigger things, right? I, I don't know if we would have been able to implement the pre-work thing if my summer had been taken up making like polling questions, right? Um, and so like being able to kind of have different people working on different sections of this, I think contributes a lot to that. I, I can kind of start, I guess. Um, I, I think, I mean, for me, it's, you know, a, a lot of what I, I think my time is like best spent on is like the implementation of things, right? Because I think that's one thing the undergrad is not going to have a, a lot of insight into is like the back end of like how you construct a syllabus and like what, you know, how you implement these things in terms of course policy. Um, and so I, I think our course structure is a, a little unique as well in that like I, I'm the instructor, but I'm not teaching at all, right? So the professors are up there giving lectures, and so I'm kind of the middle person that's um, anything that like Catherine created, you know, I'm the one that kind of works on like communicating with the professors of like, here's this thing, you know, Catherine's made, you know, how do we want to distribute this and like really deploy it? Um, and so I think that type of thing is like where I tried to focus my energy on, because it's very easy to get wrapped up in just like making a million polling questions, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for the question. I think there are several layers to this now that we have developed this new structure. I almost feel like self-conscious asking the student to redo and do an exact copy of this. So right now I've been uh, trying to rebuild and slowly as the semester goes on to clean up and replicate this structure that I co-developed with my student in my other classes that I teach. Of course, I'm kind of chasing the train as it's going forward, right? So I think ideally in the future, I would love to collaborate with one of my students who has taken the improved version of the course and see if there are further suggestions or perhaps critiques. So I think their student perspective would be great. And Mackenzie, who worked with us, already had some ideas and we did a micro Europe in the fall. She suggested that we have vocabulary resources for each module, each thematic module. She suggested a database of vocabulary for the entire semester and she started working on that, but then uh, you know, we'll still have to continue that. But thank you. Yeah, with um, MIT undergrads are trained to be problem solvers, so um, I think the thing that they need more training on, and the thing that I, when I'm thinking about this, is that well, what's which, what's the right problem, and which problem is it? So um, in this case, I think it was having a dialogue with them, having done the pre-work ourselves of understanding well, what exactly is the, the bulk of the class, and then just talking through the problems and identifying, all right, so based on these, here are some sub-problems, here are some possible solutions, and then they didn't just go straight out and, do it and work on it. They did, I think Adam did one um, draft because he thought that would be the one that we'd want to go, and he was right. He had, a, he had some intuition there because he'd taken the class before. So it's a little bit of trusting the student to have that perspective because they're coming from it from that. But it's also, um, and I have a problem where everything's a, a nail. For me, my hammer is features. These are all just features um, for software, right? So I could just say, well, you're, it's your feature, you do it. I'm the product owner or whatever, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to sell, tell you whether it's good or not. Um, and then there's enough iterative cycles in between, there's enough back and forth in between that it doesn't veer like, way out of, out of line, it stays within the, the needs for, for what we're doing. And I'll, I'll say one thing about our end of supporting these projects. You know, our responsibility in being in the room and sort of overseeing these projects and being the quote unquote managers of, of the students in terms of their time and energy week, week in and week out. Part of it is our background in consulting on these and having an, an understanding of the breadth of options that do exist within Canvas. So that if maybe you know it makes the most sense to, to go to this external tool or maybe it makes most sense to come back around to a, a new version of discussion boards or new quizzes or something else, we can sort of provide that space, provide that opportunity and direction to, to the students to explore what that would look like for their specific project as a starting point, rather than having to like start from the very beginning, scouring everything that exists. So I, I think the, the sort of back and forth between us and supporting them in that is also big. And the, the other piece I'll say is, um, 
what an exceptional group of students we have sort of as a pool to, to pull from. We've heard how awesome this group is, but honestly, every time I've ever worked with an undergraduate on a course that we've talked about, it's been amazing. Um, and so just a, a shout out to all of them because without them, none of this goes forward. This project concerned one specific class partially because I already had a student and I already started teaching this new class in this format. But in terms of orientation and interface, I hope everyone can respond. I think it's of paramount importance. And I think working with a student made, made me even more aware of that, that we have to help them navigate through the Canvas site. We, since they helped build it, they know its structure. But I think it's a big reminder that this experience of interacting with a student uh, is uh, kind of how important it is to convey, this is how we build it, this is why it makes sense, this is where you should go consistently. But I don't know if you have comments on kind of this meta level guidance for the learning process. Yeah, I think for orientation, because this was the first we had tried any type of like pre-work in a class. And I think like one thing we really focused on was how do we communicate it to the student? And so one thing we did is like we put it in the first week of the class. Um, because I think it was really important that I think students respond very differently if they spend half a semester and then like now we're asking them to do this extra work, right? Um, so I think the fact that it was, you know, in the beginning of the course, um, we tied it, it was kind of easy points for a grade. Yes, there were test yourself questions, but we give them like three or four attempts per question. I, I think like some of the multiple choice questions, like it's like four options and we give them three attempts. And so like, unless you're like really just kind of spamming answers, you'll, it's mostly participation credit, just like engage with the content. Um, and I think students, I mean, I think we also in our messaging, the professor as well, we kind of coordinated with him and he kind of explained like, here's why we're doing this. This is like traditionally a topic students find really challenging. And so we're kind of approaching this in a, a new kind of direction um, to help you learn this topic. Um, and I think that seems to have been received well. Um, I think it's to be seen if we do that more, um, if it'll continue to be re um, received well, or if you, know, if you can overtax them with this type of thing if you do it too frequently. So way back, I used to give the entire syllabus on day one and just go through it. And I very quickly realized it's not how you do things. <laughs> They're not going to absorb it. And you get really bored saying all of it out loud. Uh, so everything we do is kind of just in time. So. Uh, day one, we're not even using Canvas because not all of them are on it, especially my uh, cross-listed uh, folks. Um, so we're just on Google Google Forms. And then day day two, week two, um, we're going to do a discussion post. So that's like the first thing we do is just, what is a discussion post and how are we using them in our class? Um, and then a little bit later, it's an assignment. And then a little bit later, it's the developer diary. And by that point, I hope everyone's figured it out. Um, every year, there's a mistake that I make. And so the person who tells me, hey, you made that mistake, I'm like, great. Who else saw this mistake? And now I have a, a chance to see who's actually using Canvas daily versus not. I don't want that to be the case, but it's actually a pretty good metric. Um, so don't put in mistakes, but when you do have mistakes, mm -hmm. use it as a, all right, how, like, it's always thinking about not just are you understanding the material, but it's also are you understanding how to use the resources? How are, are you understanding how to use the tools that we're using? Um, and then, yeah, exactly. When we were, when we introduced flip lecture materials, um, we were very intentional in talking about it and why we were doing it. The students then later on said, "We prefer it when you give us lectures in class." Uh, and so right now, it's kind of just unpacking. Well, what are they getting out of the lecture in class versus the flip lecture? Is it the time spent on it? Is the opportunity to ask a question? Uh, we're still kind of unpacking uh, what the difference is. Yeah, and so, you know, having a background in learning sciences and hearing all of these things, I'm like flagging the research that I can sort of point to for, for each of these strategies and, and some of the sort of underlying reasons why. Yeah, of course, like if I'm just sitting passively, of course I'm going to, like that's easier, but am I actually engage, like, am I engaging with the content in a meaningful way that's going to help me understand it later, right? Like there, there's these pieces that we have to sort of think about and we have to be very careful when we implement and implement. But I'll, I'll answer your question in, in one other way. We had a separate project uh, for, as part of the CIF where one of the things that was handed off as final documentation was actually a, a set of resources for the students about how they were going to use a new tool that was going to be implemented called Perusal. So the, the whole first sort of 
day of their campus activity was going into and seeing that document and the students engaging with this idea of like, here's how I click on perusal, here's what I go and do, here's the, oh, when, I, when I'm given an assignment, here's what the expectation is, right? And so the instructor was able to walk them through that. But that was part of the thing that we built in as part of the handoff materials for that specific project. So I think it also depends, right? Um, but yeah, these are, these are great questions. Thank you. All right, I think that's it. I think that's time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Please.